issues. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, and that is Dr. Craig Mish. His presentation is entitled, Autogenous Bone Versus Biologics, Graph Selection for Success. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Mish. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Scientific Committee for the gracious invitation, uh, especially Dr. Nick Complanis and Dr. Jaime Lozada. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar friends, uh, long, long time uh, member of this academy, so it's always an honor to be invited to speak. As David had mentioned, uh, my topic is looking at autogenous bone versus, versus biologics. Uh, before I start, let me just, uh, is this clicker not working? There it goes. I do have affiliations with universities as well as several manufacturers, uh, although I'm not getting any honorarium for this presentation today. So to begin with, I want to get everyone on the same foundation. Uh, two axioms that I have. The morphology of a bone defect should influence our choice of a material or technique for repair. The second axiom is sites with less bone with fewer bony walls or greater atrophy. These sites are more demanding and require materials or techniques that offer greater biologic activity and regenerative capacity. So this is the foundation for what we'll be discussing today. We manage horizontal defects, vertical defects, and most often three-dimensional or combination type defects. Now, some of you have seen this sleight of hand that I've shown before. I'm gonna do a 15 millimeter vertical augmentation. I'm gonna use bone substitutes with no membrane, no biologics, no autogenous bone. I place the graft, I wait four months, and I grew 15 millimeters of vertical bone. And you say, well, no, Craig, you didn't do that. You, you did a socket graft. You did 15 millimeters of a socket graft. Well, that's an important point because so many times I see from the podium, people present cases where they do vertical augmentation on intrabony defects. And as we'll discuss, these are very different than extra bony defects when we talk about the topic of vertical augmentation. Intrabony defects would include socket grafts, sinus grafts I put in this category, and then intraosseous bone defects in the, in, in the ridge. Very different than defects that are outside the bony housing. So is it a autogenous bone or biologics that are really the gold standard today? So let's briefly talk about the history of a autogenous bone. First publications on using a autogenous bone with integrated implants come from the Swedish, primarily managing the completely edentulous patient. They admitted there was a learning curve. You know, this is back in the infancy of implant dentistry. They used large grafts from the iliac crest, uh, machined implants exclusively. They put very often the implants in the same time as the graft. And when you look at survival rates, very low. Survival rates many times were lower than 80% with this technique. Unfortunately, the bad experience with uh, implants with autogenous grafts kind of carried over to the present in many clinicians' minds even today when we talk about the use of autogenous grafts. You're all familiar with the tissue engineering triad. The triad of having signaling molecules or growth factors, a scaffold that's usually some mineral construct, and then cells that are present, whether they're osteoblast or mesenchymal stem cells. And autogenous bone fulfills all three aspects of the tissue engineering triad. Given adequate time and the proper environment, you're gonna regenerate bone quite predictably with this. The perfect bone graft is a cortical cancellous bone graft. It's osteogenic, it's osteoinductive, it's osteoconductive. If we look at other types of autogenous bone, such as a cortical graft, you see I've whited out osteogenesis because we really don't have cells that are capable of producing bone. We have osteocytes. These are uh, osteoblasts that became entrapped within the bone. They don't have the capacity to grow bone, but as we'll discuss, osteocytes do play a role in bone homeostasis and may even influence bone grafts. But cortical grafts are certainly osteoinductive and osteoconductive, and they work quite well in implant dentistry because as they incorporate we now have this dense bone, bony ridge, to be able to place our implants and support our prosthesis. The first attempt to replace the autogenous bone was really a demineralized, uh, freeze-dried bone allograft. Developed by Urist, Urist invented BMP or discovered BMP, if you will, placing the product within 
the pouches, uh, muscle pouch of ra uh, rats, and finding that, that it produced ectopic bone. I will tell you, it's much easier to grow bone in rats than it is humans. And I think we all realize today, when we look at uh, demineralized bone products, they really have a low potency of osteoinductivity. They're mildly inductive or weakly inductive at best. And when you look at the amount of BMP that's present in bank bone, it's measured in picograms versus the, the biologics that we have available today, we measure in milligrams, being you know, a million times the, the, the uh, concentration. There's a variability of BMP from bone banks. The study on the right took 113 lots of bank bone, different um, um, lots from the same bone bank and measured how much BMP was present. You see it's all over the map, some very low, some are higher. When they implanted the products into rats, they found that there was a direct correlation with the more BMP there was, the more bone that those formed. Now bone banks are getting better and they have different methods of processing to make this product a better product, but we have to admit that this, the osteoinductive capacity still isn't great with these products. In addition, they have poor scaffolding effects, especially the demineralized product. Usually you have to add something to it to give it uh, more of a scaffold. And then certainly there are risks that are present, but these are, are quite low. Patients accept using their own bone. They don't like the fact that you have to take it from somewhere else, but they will understand that if you take bone from one area of their body and transplant it to another area that it should work well. And they may have concerns with bank bone, cow bone, and some of the biologics, we're seeing some medical legal issues uh, come into patients' minds as well when we talk about using them. They're definitely economical. I mean, there is a huge economic benefit to using a Tajus bone. You pay for it with your time to harvest it, but I'll talk about local harvesting of bone that really doesn't add much time or morbidity to the patient compared to some of the biologics which can get quite pricey. The main reason I've used a Tajus bone throughout my career is really predictable volume gains. Patients come to us because they want implant teeth. If they don't have adequate bone, and I can't grow bone, then they're not gonna get implant teeth, so I have to do that very predictably. So let's look at this topic. Um, first, let's look at horizontal bone augmentation. There's essentially four ways that we can augment a bone, a ridge horizontally, GBR, blocks, ridge expansion, or mesh. Now what I've done is I've gone into the literature to look at articles that talk about how much bone we can form using different techniques, and appreciate that Malinkovic and Cordato aren't saying that you're limited to these gains. They're just reporting in the literature what the averages are to try and give clinicians guidance. And they're saying with a ridge split, you get around three millimeters. With GBR techniques, on average, you get about three millimeters. With a block graft, you get a little over four millimeters. Um, if you look at Jensen Terheden's uh, work, they said, well, GBR ranges from around two and a half to four and a half millimeters, and the blocks are around four to five and a half millimeters. So there's certainly a trend in the literature that you can gain more horizontal bone with blocks than you can with GBR. Um, in addition, if you look at regrafting, very infrequently needed. I think we all agree that horizontal bone augmentation is quite predictable, the results that we can get. And I think what's important for every clinician to have some type of decision tree in their own practice, what works for them. And here I, we look at, if you have minimal needs, less than two millimeters of bone gain required, you can use GBR or ridge expansion techniques. In the, air, in the range of two to four millimeters of bone that you need to augment, you can use all four methods. But if you want to go over four millimeters gain, the, the literature tells us that we should look at the block graft as probably being the most predictable way to do that. If we use GBR or titanium mesh, that we might have to alter the technique and use different materials. We might need to use a Tajus bone in the GBR or the mesh procedure as we'll discuss. If we look at vertical bone augmentation, there's essentially five ways we can augment the ridge, GBR, blocks, mesh, distraction, or inlay graphs. Now, this systematic review on vertical bone augmentation shows that implant survival rates are pretty high except for the block graft group down to 76% to 100, and I'll come back and touch upon this. But we, what we also glean from this article is there's a high rate of complications with vertical bone augmentation, even with experienced clinicians doing the procedure. I also wanted to point out something that some clinicians aren't aware of, is when you look at vertical GBR, 
there's a consistent pattern of what is reported in the literature of what clinicians are using, and that is titanium reinforced PTFE membranes with particulate autograft as part of the component. So they're not using bone substitutes in these vertical augmentation studies to obtain these, these uh, volume gains.